Hi, I'm Harry and this is my mom. Hi, I'm Kirsten Bernhardt. And today we're going to do a video for a video game called Assassin's Creed Revelations, which is the fourth in the series and it's the third of the Ezio trilogy. And so Harry, this is a game that you and I enjoyed playing together. And uh, it was probably uh, the best game to date, don't you think? At the time. This is the fourth game in the series. Well, I thought it was far better than its predecessor, Brotherhood, but I thought it was a little bit worse than its predecessor, 2. Really? No, 2 was your favorite game? It was. Oh. I, uh, I'm, I'm surprised by that. Did I play 2 with you? You did. We'll talk about that another day. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so back to Revelations. This is the uh, game that introduces Ezio. Ezio Auditori. Yes, yes. And Ezio is a, a wonderful character. What were your impressions of Ezio? I loved Ezio. I felt so emotionally invested in him. And since the Ezio trilogy was over, other characters like Haytham or Connor or even Cassandra, I have never felt the emotional investment that I felt within Ezio. You know, Ezio really was a great character, and in, in much of this game, it was a little bit like watching a movie, as we saw the cutscenes unveil, and the characters were just so well written and had such full personalities, and physically they were very attractive. The, the graphics of the people's faces were uh, an enormous improvement over previous games. Did you think so? Absolutely. This game starts out with a very dramatic beginning, where we see Ezio setting off to the city of Masaf, which is highly abandoned at the time, where he wants to find the secrets of Altair. When he arrives at that fortress, it's near deserted, and we start by seeing him get hit with the arrow, and then dozens of Byzantines just ambush him, and despite him being all alone with nothing but a hidden blade, he fights like a badass and kicks their ass for a little while, but then he sees a vision of Altair and they overpower him. That opening was breathtaking. And the way that that man is surrounded by those guards, and it looks like it is curtains for him. And then it's just amazing how he brings it out. And that's just in the first few minutes of, of the game, isn't it? Yeah. And what's even more amazing is we're controlling a guy that's well into his 50s. Anyhow, let's talk about later on in the game. We find that the Masiaf keys have been taken, and after Ezio discovers that, he sets off to Constantinople, where he's warmly greeted by Yusuf, uh, and he meets Prince Suleiman on the boat, as well as Sophia Sarder, who's this bookkeeper. Yeah, this is a game where they're really establishing the idea of the assassin's Brotherhood, that we've got a full-on set of assassins. There are assassins' dens throughout the city, and Ezio really seems to be the leader of the group of assassins, and it's very clearly at this point a well-developed rivalry between the Templars as the uh, representatives of a group that wants to impose control over humanity. The Byzantines. And the assassins who want free will for humanity. Indeed. Do you remember those den defense missions? I hated the den defense missions. What did you think of them? I didn't think they were that bad. I enjoyed them. Well, the den defense missions were, you know, fisticuffs and, and battling. And you are probably one of the world's greatest battlers. And, and those were the parts of the game where I would say, Harry, Harry, come fight this fight. And you would come in and, and fight the fight. I, I was not, I, I'm not as big on the fighting as Harry is, but of course the game is Assassin's Creed and fighting is exactly what assassins do. What I'm first gonna talk about in this game is that this game has many new features that its predecessors didn't have, such as the hook blade. The hook blade is, is pretty cool because it, it allows you to do a zip line. So you, you've got this hook blade that you, you can grab lines with and go zipping across the city. And you can also use it to 
pull things over on top of your enemies as you're running. It took me a little bit of time to master the use of the hook blade, but I thought it was a great uh, addition to the game. What did you think? I thought the hook blade was wonderful. The game also involved many new features such as call trap bombs, zip lining, and it even had those den defense missions which you already said you didn't like. And I did not care for the bombs. Now as I recall, Harry, you were great at building the bombs and knowing how to use them. And and for me, it was just it was just more detail really than than I was interested in. I didn't want to stop and manufacture bombs. I didn't want to remember what kind of bombs needed what. And, and in the middle of a fight, I could never for the life of me remember what kind of bomb to throw. And so you'd be saying, Mom, throw a caltrop bomb. And I'd be like, a what? But um, you seem to handle those pretty well. Did you like the addition of the bomb feature in this game? I wasn't too crazy about it, but I could use it. Yeah. Did, did that feature survive into the later games? It did not. I guess maybe other people weren't all that crazy about it either. No, they weren't too crazy about Den Defense either. Another thing I'd like to talk about on this game is that even though it didn't have a whole lot of new features from its predecessors, the graphic revolution was far superior to its predecessor Brotherhood, which made the gameplay in 15th century Constantinople be breathtaking and beautiful every turn. This game did come out 10 years ago. This game was from 2011. So compared to the most recent games, this one uh, maybe doesn't hold up as well. But at the time, it was stunning. I thought it was the most beautiful game I had seen in my life. And, and the game benefits from the, the, the rich setting in Florence. The, Gorgeous clothes, not not Florence. Well, weren't we in Florence for part of this game? We started in Rome and set out to Messiah. Oh, well. At any rate, we have these these incredibly rich clothes that even the men, uh, the Sultan, we encounter Suleiman and his uncle and family, and the the clothing that the people are wearing is just amazingly detailed. We have the architecture of the cities, we go underground, we're on the rooftops, we're inside the buildings, and, and it just feels like this incredible tour of, of, of the Byzantine era. Absolutely. What did you think of the political intrigue with the Sultan family? I thought the the quasi-historical aspects of Assassin's Creed are always fun. It's one of my favorite parts. Now, the uh, Ottoman Empire, I don't know, is, was it in fact the Ottoman Empire? It was in that time. <clears throat> is, is not something that I'm as familiar with, but I've certainly heard of Suleiman the Great. And in this story, he's a young man and uh, Ezio actually protects him against the machinations of other people who are trying to depose his father and depose him as Sultan. And so those aspects I think are always fun. What do you think of those? I thought the uh, political intrigue could be a little bit boring, but it's still made for an interesting story. One of the most humorous moments of the game was when we went to Prince Suleiman's basement with this instrument, I forgot what it was, and we, we go around... a lute. Yeah, and we go around making distractions where we sing to these crowds because Templars are hidden there in disguise, and the assassins working with us are supposed to sneak by and kill them while we make the distraction by our poor singing. Right. In order to get into the party, we had to be in disguise, and we realized in our disguises that we couldn't carry our swords. What could we carry? A lute. However, we were uh, not very good minstrels. And so every time we would go up to a group, the group would say, go away, go away. But and it was, it was pretty funny. Distraction. Yes, it was, it was a funny part of the game. What I thought was different about this game from its predecessors is when we arrive in Constantinople, we meet Yusuf, Sophia, and Prince Suleiman, 
and you just feel a heartwarming welcome in Constantinople as if it's your second home. I just felt a real emotional connection to the characters. And one of the saddest moments in the game was at Yusuf's death. Yes, yes. Yusuf was with us throughout the story, and and when he died, it really was a, a gut punch. This game had a, a number of good stories and characters. It, it seemed to me that maybe the writing of this game was was the best yet. We also had the the story an evolving love story between Ezio and Sophia. So Ezio, as an assassin, he doesn't have the time for a wife. He can't put her in danger. But here's this beautiful, educated woman, and he loves her. And, and as we see that relationship builds, it's, it's very sweet. And of course, at some point, she's taken captive, and he has to rush in to the rescue. Yep. We find later on that the Vincentines that were supposed to kill Prince Suleiman were led by his uncle, Ahmed. Yes, Ahmed was not entirely unsympathetic. What did you think of Ahmed? Although Ahmed is considered to be villainous, I felt that he was not evil. He had a place where he came from, uh, he was sick of bloodshed and war, and what he wanted was peace. However, his methods to get peace I felt were unjust. He wanted men to all move with one body and one mastermind. And to achieve true peace, he believed that was what he had to accomplish. So his goals were in the nature of someone who supports a strong dictatorship because they believe that that keeps the people safe, uh, in it, it a strong paternalistic system with, with heavy control over the people and a loss of free will. But he seemed sincere in his belief that this would bring about peace, and that's what he wanted for people. I felt Ahmet was probably the most sympathetic villain of any Assassin's Creed villain, and I felt that his nature was very lawful. And don't you think that that is another tribute to the writing of this game? We we don't often hear who the writer is. We don't know if the writer that wrote this story is the same one who wrote the next game. But all these features that we're talking about are uh, the hallmarks of a really good writer behind the story. I thought the dynamics were great, the plot was brilliant, and what we see are the final days of both Ezio and Altair. The Altair story was beautiful. And of course we had followed Altair in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, but it really felt as if they brought Altair home, both figuratively and literally, in this story taking place 300 years later. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, as most of you probably know, in the first Assassin's Creed game we play as Altair, but I never really felt a bond with Altair, and Revelations just brought a real emotional connection between me and Altair, which I liked a lot. As Ezio has to travel the path of Altair, and in fact, there's a point at which it appears that the ghost of Altair is leading us up the, the castle walls and, you know, jumping from the parapets and across the towers and over, and we're following Altair. And it's a, it's a really powerful bonding experience between these brothers, between the fraternity of the assassins, one reaching across the centuries to guide the other one. Although we played as mostly Ezio and some of Altair, the main character in this game is Desmond. Although the main character in this game is Desmond, he got himself trapped in the animus in this game to where he gets the short end of the stick. The game starts with Desmond, the character from the contemporary time, is in a coma because of the events that happened to him at the end of Brotherhood. He was betrayed 
and ultimately he ends up in a coma. So he is trying to find his way out, find his way back to himself through the Animus. Although Desmond is the main character, when you play this game you will most likely forget all about Desmond. I never really cared much for the parts about Desmond, but I have to say that the best of the Desmond stuff I thought was in this game. My least favorite parts are the parts involving the Desmond framing device. I would be just as happy if we were following, following Ezio or Altair or whoever. The whole animus construct of the person in the modern day is generally my least favorite part. That being said, Desmond is a pretty good character and he has a lot going on in, in this show. What do you think of the Desmond framing device? We didn't get to play Desmond much in this game, but I really enjoyed Desmond and some of its predecessors. Anyhow, back to Ezio. We see in the early 16th century Constantinople, Ezio's much more mature now. He has a chaste but blossoming relationship with the librarian Sophia, which we see slowly develop throughout the game. Yes, the Sophia story is wonderful. Sophia is a lovely, she's beautiful, she's an educated woman, she's clearly a match for Ezio. Very well drawn character, very well written character. And of course Ezio, being an assassin, he doesn't really have time for marriage, he doesn't have the ability to settle down. And plus, he's afraid that a connection with him would make her a target. And, in fact, it does. She gets kidnapped, taken hostage, and of course he has to go flying in to the rescue. But I thought the Sophia parts of the story were wonderful. Did you enjoy those? I thought it was touching. What makes it even more touching is that he developed a great deal of rapport with Sophia so much rapport that despite him being exiled from Constantinople, Sophia stays by his side and follows him wherever he will go, and she goes with him on his journey to find the Masyaf keys left behind by Altair. Yes. And then at the end, we, we go back and we see the final chapter, the final chapter of the Altair story. And there was so such a touching moment when Altair is saying goodbye to his adult son, and his son hugs his father and says to him, everything good that I am came from you. To see these two strong men, these tough warriors, these assassins, hugging and, and being sentimental in this way. I thought was really a, a, a brave choice and very well written. I felt that Altair's death left for a bittersweet ending in the game. One of the most powerful scenes of the entire game is a cutscene near the end where we see the uh, last moments of Altair. And he goes into his library sits and then later Ezio comes in and finds him and we have this powerful bonding and connection again between these brothers the the brotherhood of assassins reaching across from the centuries as they pass the the wisdom and the and the objects down to each other and in a way it's a uh, it connects also to the framing device because as Altier is taking these uh, uh, almost sacred memories and, and the object, the Apple of Eden, and passing it to Ezio, so Ezio is holding it for uh, Desmond, who is in there as well. I think that left for a memorable, bittersweet ending. It was a very touching ending. Anyhow, what would you give that game out of 10? 
I think I would give that game an eight and a half. I'm going to give it a nine. It was a beautiful, beautiful game and extremely well written. I thought so too. So is there anything else you'd like to say about AC Revelations? Even though this game is almost 10 years old, it's well worth playing. If you want to get into any of the Assassin's games, uh, be sure to, you know, at least play uh, Brotherhood and Revelations <clears throat> and, and progress on up. Uh, don't play them backwards as I did because, because then you, you miss the loss of items and uh, the things that you've learned to do that aren't in those earlier games. Revelations is a great game and well worth playing. We highly recommend it. I agree you should never play them backwards. You had me play them backwards. Yep. Well, I think that's about it. Anyhow, stay gold. Thanks for watching.